Welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Greta Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the center and this is the penultimate talk for, uh, for this week and for our series after a four months that we have been traveling uh, around the planet, but also to New York and America to hear voices of artists, of theater artists, performance artists, and how they experience this uh, uh, this moment, this time um, of Corona, where we are all faced in this existential questions, uh, situations, and it's a dangerous, dangerous uh, time. And but it's different everywhere in the world. And as we learned from all our talks, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, lots we have in common. We are all connected, but also individual experiences are different. And also answers and solutions found for the freedom performing arts. Um, are uh, different. America still is in a disastrous uh, place. Over 150,000 dead people, most probably 40, 50 million people with infections. It's 10 times more than 10, 10, 13, 14 times more than the testing suggests. And, uh, and of course, a leadership we feel uh, is not able to address, to help, to protect people actually causing deaths. That's what we say in these policies. Uh, are murderers for some people and the disenfranchised communities who have not been in the center. They are suffering. African Americans are twice as likely to die uh, from infections because of uh, the long, long discrimination and, uh, and uh, it's a hard time. Theaters are closing, small places are closing, nothing is open in New York City. Restaurants, you can't go inside. If you go through Midtown, where our credit center is, every second store is empty, it's pulled out. Uh, it's uh, barricaded even still. It's uh, a bit apocalyptic almost. But uh, we all hope that the election perhaps will bring will bring a change. But as much as we complain uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the US here, which New York was the epicenter at the moment for a moment in the planet Earth and moved on to Florida and California. But there are places in the world that have been struggling with uh, civil war, with uh, social injustices, discrimination, and uh, for a much longer time where the corona is just perhaps one of many things. They go through one of those places is Lebanon and the city of Beirut. I was there two, two years ago, I think, and I liked it very, very much. And the spirit of it was the American University in Beirut with Sahar Asaf and her team. And, uh, and so this is a place that matters, that is important. Uh, this great artist, a vibrancy, a city that came back from a civil war on the green line that divided um, the city. Um, and we need to hear from uh, from the Middle East and uh, next to Tunis or Tunisia, what I would say, Beirut truly is an open city. And it's still so complicated uh, uh, what is happening there. And I can only imagine what the Corona crisis put out after the December uprising and now this incredible complicated financial disaster situation. So we have with us two artists, two theater artists, significant ones, ones that are really at the front lines. It's Dima Mikhail Mata and Yara Nassar. So welcome and thank you for taking the time uh, to, to join us. Hi, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, so uh, I will just say a little bit about both of you and then we, we go in. Dima is a writer, actress, and a, a lecturer at a university for creative writing in English. A Fulbright scholar is a great thing, and a Fulbright has been so much good in the world. And uh, she uh, studied at Rutgers University in creative writing, and she founded Cliffhangers in 2014, a bilingual storytelling platform in Beirut taking on a very old tradition and redefining it with new new ideas, new uh, technology and new um, dramaturgical uh, interventions. Um, her first play, this is not a memorized script. This is a well-rehearsed story. Word uh, in the Schlag Festival had some readings in New York and actually was open or open we have to talk about it in February 2020, shortly before the Corona crisis in Beirut, working on her play Yara is a Lebanese performer, writer and director, a theater maker, and she's interested in inspecting her identity with respect to the collective memory and the paradoxical binaries of her society. And she approaches themes that often focus on the deconstruction of social stereotypes and daily, daily behavior in urban contexts like Beirut 
as well as the private and intimate space uh, uh, where we in it. Uh, you in in your apartment or in the our personal relationship so uh, she got selected for a three months residency at la city international bazaar she's developing a new work the misadventure of a hypothetical french woman and following her family and questions belonging to timing and decision making process and she is part of a collective that's developing a new work with the theater neumarkt uh, in zurich and station beirut and I think we said it will it premiere in April 2020. So I don't think uh, that really happened. Happen. So uh, anyway, you guys, um, I hope you will forgive me my, my introduction. Really, this is about listening to you. Um, where are you and what time is it? Ima, maybe you start. Um, well, I'm in, I'm in Beirut. I'm in uh, my apartment and uh, it's 7 p.m. here. And um, yeah, and the sun is about to set, so I'm about I'm participating in the talk, and I will witness the sunset uh, soon behind you. Good. So if it gets dark, we had once a talk. I think it was from the Palestine, and uh, it got so dark in the room, so we had to put some light on, but it worked. So I hope you will be will be in the light and enlighten us. Um, what neighborhood are you in in Beirut? Eshrafiye. Uh, mm. uh, which uh, literally means uh, the place that looks uh, looks out on the other places. It's a small hill in Beirut. Oh, so you're up towards the hill, so you look down and you see the ocean and uh, yes. the city. Oh, oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And Yara, where are you? Well, I'm 10 minutes away from Dino. Uh, it's also 7 p.m. I'm also in my apartment. I prepared the light. Good. Good. And yeah. Is um, the neighborhood uh, where you in? I'm next to the museum, so I'm down by the museum Matthaf. So it's the end of Ashrafiya, beginning of Matthaf. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 The museum that I, where the director saved lots of the sculpture from the Civil War by putting concrete around them, right? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the classical yeah. work. Uh, Sharpshooter still. You see the impact of bullets uh, on the mosaics, these thousands of years old mosaics, yeah. quite, quite a place where you are. So how how are you guys experience this moment? What's, what is going on in Beirut? Yara, would you start? Yeah, I mean, I can. Okay, so I was actually in Zurich uh, after um, I, I would like actually to mention the play because we worked on the play in February and uh, Dima and I, and I directed the play and we had been working for months and uh, then the revolution started in October so we postponed the play from November to February which now seems like really long time ago but it's not. So. Um, and then after that I actually went to Zurich to, uh, to work on uh, the play, the, the performance you just mentioned that was of course postponed uh, but it, was, it came out as a form of publication uh, for the moment and I recently came back to Beirut so I've been here now for three weeks or four weeks and um, it has been very weird to witness the pandemic and the economic collapse that is happening and all the political frustration that we're witnessing uh, from far and from the blissful town of Zurich where everything is very calm and beautiful and the public space is very there for us to enjoy even during a pandemic <laughs> so it was really weird uh, for me uh, and now i'm in transition actually because i will be moving for a while to zurich to join the ensemble of theater neumark uh, so yeah I, it feels very weird to be suspended in this moment in beirut um, and i don't know what to feel so much or but it definitely has changed massively in the four months where i've when i've been away uh it's it's uh it's really it's also apocalyptic actually and and sad but um yeah uh, i think for now i i can pass the the conversation to dima and then <laughs> Well, um, so uh, so as Yara said, we um, we premiered the the play in February, 
And uh, then two weeks later, uh, the lockdown uh, began. And so um, it was it was very strange because it kind of went from, um, you know, I, a week before that we had we had a party, we were at a bar celebrating um, the things we had accomplished and and the play and and all of that. And suddenly, two weeks later, um, um, there was suddenly nothing. Right, everything closed. Um, uh, we were told to stay at home. Only supermarkets, bakeries, and pharmacies were open. Um, and suddenly, there's this um, kind of alternate reality that that began for us, yeah. where uh, you know we're, we're, we all learned how to cook, and uh, we all stayed at home, constantly reading about uh, the pandemic, constantly checking the numbers of people uh, who were infected, the number of people who passed away, um, always reading all these articles. OK, now wear a mask. Now actually it's saying maybe the mask is not uh, uh, enough. Wash your hands. Actually, it's not the surfaces. It's some right. So all these contradictory articles that come, kept coming up and we were just taking in so much information that we were all just like balls of anxiety. And meanwhile, in parallel, the country um, was sinking in uh, a massive economic collapse. Uh, the Lebanese pound lost so much value. Um, the, just to give you a little bit of an idea, yeah. um, a dollar was 1,500 Lebanese mm -hmm. pounds. Mm -hmm. And now it's fluctuating, but it's around 8,000 Lebanese pounds. Yeah, almost a tenth what it was instead of having a dollar you have 10 cents almost yeah. actually i have to say something also the the contradiction that happened from being in the street for months and months and months and occupying public spaces again and everything for me when i came back and went out the first time and saw the downtown and all the streets empty it was it was just it was like it was never there this was very, uh, very intense to see. And uh, I think the pandemic has been a gift to the government, <laughs> actually, because it gave them room to uh, to silence the people again, or at least to try to silence the people again and um, to really get comfortable and spread all their oppression. <laughs> so, yeah. It's... Yeah, I, I don't know how... how, how much people do know but if i understand right in december everybody was on the street day after day sahar i think she was called from while being on the uh, demonstration says the, really the entire city was involved and it was not one or two or a small something it was a really um, um a, a massive showing as a, what uh, the philosopher who was with us on monday said that people like always on the street who imagine a different life who want to see a different model of the world who think things can be better and they went out to protest to demand a share a fairer share so it was a massive uh, uh, i think mm -hmm. event so was it an uprising was it a revolution uh, what what do you guys think uh, it was a it's a revolution for sure it started on october 17th um and you know i i don't think revolutions end right it's not because right now we're not in in millions in the streets it doesn't mean that we're not in a state of revolution um but yes for for about three months we were in the streets every day we were blocking roads we were protesting um uh, there were about 2 million uh, people in the street, and we're only about 6 million people in the entire country. So 2 million of us in the streets yeah. um, demanding, uh, demanding our rights, demanding that something change, uh, for something to change. Everybody was tired. Everybody was exhausted. We were angry. Um, um, we've spent years and years, our parents spent years and years of just the same problems, nothing had been solved. The same people who were the warlords are now in government and they're the same. Um, and so I think on October 17th, people really just kind of collectively decided it's enough. 
Um, and so as Yara was saying, you know, this was our reality for three months. And then suddenly, you know, there's the pandemic and going back to the streets that were for so long full of people, full of life and full of hope to be completely deserted and empty uh, was very jarring and, 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 and devastating even. Yeah, I mean, also now uh, I to, to go back a bit to, to the pandemic um, situation, I mean, I did not experience it in Lebanon and I think that was for me, I was kind of grateful to be honest because I think I would have been much more triggered had I been in Beirut because the stressors around us are really a lot. So uh, I think we already don't feel safe. Uh, we already don't feel protected. So it's the, 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 then the COVID-19 comes and heightens all these feelings. And uh, um, I, I was very interested in how different uh, communities deal with the situation, even in terms of behavior. I'm super obsessed with behavior in general in relation to work. And so suddenly I, everyone has, has this new regulation on how to be in a society. And, uh, I, I, um, I actually have been working for 10 years in a hospital, um, ho different hospitals with an NGO as a clown doctor. Mm -hmm. So for me, this whole hygiene and immune, like who's immune, who's not, how we need to deal with different kids with different immunity. And suddenly it was super weird to see all this hospital behavior everywhere in the world. Should I put the mask like this? Should I wash my hands like this? Oh, okay, 20 seconds to wash. Like it just became a super um, a collective behavior everywhere in the world. And it took a whole new, yeah, space or understanding of how, also how we deal with each other when we're passing on the street, like we move and then the person waits for us or that all these weird codes that we developed so quickly. Um, it's like the opposite of being in the street on this rush and going and screaming and not caring if you're close and so it's it went from here to here oh you can't see my hands but here to here mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah it's uh, as someone said if you see a play about uh, uh, a prison the idea is we all live in a prison prisoners if it's a play about uh, uh, the military in a way we are all soldiers it seems like about hospitals or a film you know we are all patients or sick and they are not going to it's a symbolic representation and now we do have as you said what you say you know every we are all you know we're all sick the society is sick and the, the way of living things don't work that's what everybody says but in, in Beirut already I remember from my visit it was so complicated the services and the garbage and water electricity um so um it, do you think it got worse um since the street uprising or is it just now more obvious I think what an x-ray that just shows what is wrong um i mean everything became exacerbated the economic collapse was uh, was, um, you know, it, it was boiling, right? It was about to happen. And this is why people took to the streets. Um, and I think what the pandemic did is that it, it just exacerbated and uh, accelerated everything. And so, um, you know, we've always had uh, problems with uh, water, with electricity, uh, garbage filling the streets, pollution, etc. And uh, what ended up happening is that all of that just kind of took on such an enormous um, uh, space. You know, right now we get about two hours of electricity a day. Um, what time? Which, uh, I'm sorry. Around what time is it? Like a special time? They tell you. Oh, it depends. Oh, it depends. Surprise! So, uh, so we we never know when it uh, comes, when it goes. Um, um, it basically we're like okay the power is now on okay we do we do our laundry we uh, turn on the water heater we kind of try to get everything done uh, so that you know we we uh, we can charge our phones charge our laptops all of that um, so yeah no it, it just adds to the uncertainty it adds to um, how much we are we are hyper aware of how much um, 
um, we're denied our, our basic rights, basically. And also to say that, for example, for sure, uh, everything accelerated uh, since now with the pandemic and everything. But the thing is that we've been accumulating for 30 plus years uh, a massive um, um, a massive structure of oppression that is uh, very obvious in some ways and less obvious in other ways, but it's been building up and building up and building up. So it's not also the first time that people go to the street. Uh, the difference this time was that different age groups and not only in Beirut, not only working people working in arts and social um, NGOs or or uh, or like it's not only an alternative um, group of people going to the streets and trying to convince uh, the mass. It was really everyone from different uh, different uh, backgrounds and this was the for me the difference this time and this is why i i had a different hope always with a bit cautious because uh, i think i'm always aware of the possibility of um, of disappointment <laughs> but uh, it it did feel different and uh, now it's not that everything stopped. There, ha there are initiatives. There are people camping since weeks in um, Sed Bisri, which is an area where uh, there is, um, uh, they're trying to make a dam, which is super problematic on the ecological level, but also it will not bring water. It's just a huge deal to bring money to politicians. And people are camping there, uh, trying to stop that from happening. They're going to different ministries. To, so there are things happening, of course, with less, like, smaller groups of people. So it's, it's not easy to protest with a pandemic. Yeah, and if I understand right, and please correct me if it's wrong, but now you can only get $100 out or some limited amount you can get from the bank. So even uh, middle-class families are, are struggling for money and food. And, and is that, is that, is that right? Actually, I mean, uh, the days when people could withdraw $100 at a dollar days. Uh, right now, even if you have um, a certain amount of dollars in your bank account, I think it's necessary to say that uh, both currencies are in this country. And so this is why um, a lot of people have um, dollars in their bank accounts. So right now, uh, the bank is basic. Banks are holding them hostage, and they will give you uh, Lebanese pounds instead at a very low rate. So people um, are not only suffering from hyper in, from the hyperinflation um, that is happening. So it's not even just inflate; it's hyper uh, inflation. Uh, but also, we do not have access to the money that we have put in banks literally our people's money is being held hostage mm -hmm. because you have the two currencies you can always pay in lebanese or in american dollars everybody except both and so you're no longer able to draw the dollar for family mm -hmm. you know to have an emergency or to buy food or someone gets sick it's not it's always a disaster situation so what how did the performing arts come in at the moment and perhaps also at the time of the uprising the revolution did you guys stop, say we cannot do, we participate, or was it part of the demonstration? Um, yeah, I don't, you mean you, during the pandemic? Start? But uh, we're talking since the lockdown or since uh, oh, October. But let's, let's, first, let's maybe first go to December and uh, say October, November, December. How, how did you, was the theater community part of that? Or did you say we have to stop and we just help everybody else? And so, uh, for the first couple of months, everything was postponed. Like we, uh, we were supposed to do our play in November, and we decided to postpone it. Uh, actually, when we did it in February, it was maybe one of the first, or one of the, the first or the second play that um, that happened in Beirut since the since the revolution started, because. Um, there were a lot of talking uh, about whether or not there should be art at the moment, and but I, I, I personally thought it was very important to focus on what was happening organically with everyone included, not to directly take it to a more uh, uh, intellectual space. Or uh, so actually, everything stopped in the beginning, and it, it was. 
where theaters closed also like completely closed like in, in Chile, Guillermo Calderon said they closed down when they had the same on the street, they just closed and it was a lockdown already in December. Um, was theaters open or? It wasn't like officially closed or open. I think just everyone organically made the decision to, to push things, to postpone things. And uh, now with the pandemic, the theaters, I mean, it's not even really part of the conversation formally. Like, uh, there, there isn't a handbook that is given uh, that says, okay, so we reopen theaters, but uh, there's these restrictions. So each uh, each institution is kind of handling it differently. But uh, since the, there's anyway very, very little infrastructure for theater, uh, it's uh, right now. It's not even. I feel it's not even in the conversation whether the theaters should open or not, or art spaces should open or not. Right now, no, there is nothing actually happening. I, I, I was supposed to do my new performance in September, and now I just pushed it like months and months away. Um, um, what, uh, what basically, for me, kind of how, how things um, developed since October is that um, I think for for a lot of us, it was very important to be in the streets uh, and protest and be part uh, of the revolution. And and um, and artists um, were of course in the streets, right? We were in the streets, and uh, whenever you uh, you hear very catchy uh, chants, you're you're like that's probably where an artist uh, is. So we kind of did, you know headed in that direction. And, um, and so as Yara said, um, it's not that the theaters closed, it's just that we all kind of, everybody uh, decided that may, this is not the time um, to put on plays. But Yara and I, and I'm sure uh, other theater makers, uh, performers, directors kept rehearsing. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we kept, it was very difficult <laughs> because we had to focus during our rehearsals, but we were always like, had to put our phones away, but we were so gripped to it to see what was happening. You know, at one point we were rehearsing and people were being attacked by the police and the army in the streets. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I, I one day I just paused and I cried. Um, but uh, but I think for me, um, theater is revolutionary. Um, art is revolutionary. And uh, queer theater, I mean, the, the play we were working on is, uh, is a an autobiographical play that I wrote about being queer in, in Beirut and um, among other things, of course. And so, and so this subject has very little, very little in the country. And so for me, this was my way of contributing to the revolution. And, uh, and I'm sure Yara, uh, I mean, believed in it as well, because I'm, this is why this play is our, is our baby, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so when we decided to postpone it to February and when things kind of relatively calmed down, uh, normal, what is normal in Lebanon, but normal life uh, kind of uh, came back, we performed and then, um, and then two, two weeks and then maybe two other plays um, premiered during this window of opportunity. And then it was the lockdown, everything was closed, of course. And uh, as Yara was saying, there's little to no infrastructure. The state does not support the arts. Um, everything is very much uh, individual or group initiatives um, with little to no funding. And so right now I've been talking to a lot of artists because I'm actually writing an article about um, how to reimagine theater in times of pandemic and economic collapse. and. There is a little effort to to start imagining theater taking uh, a little bit more space. So, one of the theaters um, opened its doors for free um, to whoever wants to uh, stage a performance, and then the the kind of the deal was to split the uh, uh, the ticket like the revenue from ticket sales. So, uh, but now we went into another lockdown. Um, at least till August 10th, and then we'll see if the government will uh, prolong it. And so now everything is back um, to very uh, uncertain position. Basically. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, I know uh, Dima and Mosul Yara too. I mean, you were involved in the LGBTQ community, the, the Beirut Pride, uh, I think, uh, in, in 18, and uh, the storytelling work. Tell us a little bit. And also, it was very controversial, right? You were uh, from the government, the police, and uh, there was lots of interference. Well, um, so basically, in, in 2017, I hosted the, the first LGBTQ plus storytelling night uh, to take place in, in Lebanon. And it was during the first uh, Beirut Pride. So, um, which is kind of just a small, um, not a small, I mean, it was a t an attempt at kind of a small um, um, one week thing where, you know, uh, different LGBTQ plus uh, events would take place. And, um, and then the opening event was canceled because the people received uh, threats from extremist groups. Um, and then the storytelling night that I hosted was the next day. And so uh, I get to the venue, uh, which is this big um, uh, rooftop, beautiful rooftop of an art space uh, called Station. And, um, and I, I, I told the owner of the venue, I'm, I told him nobody is going to show up. And uh, about an hour later, 400 people were on that rooftop. And uh, the event went on for about four hours um, because people kept wanting to, to go up and, and share their stories um, and, uh, and basically um, and speak. We have so, and this is not only related to LGBTQ plus uh, voices, but to so many other voices. Um, that are marginalized, voices that are oppressed. We are given so little opportunity to uh, express ourselves freely. The censorship in this country is absurd and it's getting worse and worse. They, they police the arts, they police uh, what we post on social media. Um, the, the, the level of oppression is, uh, is ridiculous. So for me to, uh, to stage a, a play where um, story of a queer woman for me this was um very frightening uh but also very necessary yeah it's definitely also getting worse as dima mentioned like now it's um um it's getting to the level where if you post something on facebook you can be called into questioning and uh, even uh, people who are in the street and they're Reserves who are we're taking photos all the time, like really looking at us, taking photos. So everything was being archived. Uh, it's, um, I mean, the, there is censorship, there is oppression, but there was always a margin to speak up. Um, despite that, and somehow find the loopholes and try to, uh, to, yeah, to say what we want. Uh, but now I feel the consequences are getting worse and worse. It's just getting really ridiculous. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's like going back 15 years. And uh, I don't want to sound too, too, I don't want to be, it's not about sounding, I don't want to be too negative. I'm trying not to be, but sometimes there are days where I'm like, okay, um, we're really going backwards again. And it's, it's sad because it took really so much. I mean, uh, as I mentioned before, this was, there were so many attempts and people also before us and the older and now that there's all age groups but also before there were a lot of people trying to to uh to creating the premise for us to also do something you know and now uh, i i feel very uh, angry when i see that things are just being pulled back uh that's my overall feeling a little bit yeah. yeah, when you go back and even the great Ethel Adnan, you know, the great uh, writer, mm -hmm. poet and painter, you know, what she went through, she was trying to be there, be the editor of that art, ma that mag mag art magazine section and ultimately also left and now those cars never came back, she's in their late 80s, that's a great world to respect her, and she was not possible for her even at that time and, uh, that you all have to go through this. Um, uh, it, again, um, 
So the wrong Facebook post can get you into jail. You can get you into trouble, interrogation, or um... very active people. Yeah, people who are super uh, active, very vocal about their opinions, have been called into questioning and interrogation. And especially a few months ago, like uh, starting December, things became quite aggressive in the revolution. Like December, January, there was a lot of police brutality and a lot of interrogation. So a lot of people would be pulled from the street and beaten, and a lot of activists um, were were called over Facebook posts, over yeah, over being vocal, saying what you <coughs> sorry, what is actually very um, uh, like the level of corruption that exists uh, doesn't shy away. It's it's insane. Like how can you actually call people for saying the truth that is so obvious you know then yeah yeah and 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 i think thinking of this um we've uh, and and um, you might you might know this because you know you visited beirut and uh, you uh you've spoken to sahar asaf and i'm sure other theater makers uh frank but um all every script um that um, will be performed on stage has to be uh submitted to the to general security to the censorship bureau for them to inspect it and approve or not uh, for it to be staged and so anything that pertains to religion politics and sex um is heavily censored which um right i mean Mm-hmm. Um, there's little, uh, you know, what what else is worth talking about, one might argue, um, right? We want to attack political structures, religious structures, the patriarchy, homophobia, etc. Um, especially when you're a theater maker or an artist that engages in um, in political theater, in, in, in engaged, the, uh, engaged art, um, then it becomes... Um, very limited and, and very frustrating and very actually sometimes dangerous to stage a play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And part part of that is also because, I mean, our history has not been resolved because, uh, uh, as Dima mentioned, we still have the same uh, people who were part of the war, warlords now in power, and we have had these people since the war ended officially ended let's say or formally ended um so uh we don't have the we don't have all the civil war in history books we don't study that for example in schools because uh, it's too sensitive you know it's a sensitive topic and and it's so relative like uh, each person depending on uh, how they lived the war or where they were during the war has a different take on what happened so um so the the coping mechanism is let's not talk about it but it's all the time there in every single thing the 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 names of the people that we see on the news are like all like like just representing the war constantly on a daily basis this we have to take but oh no it's too sensitive to talk about this topic or about religions and sects and and patriarchy and yeah but you look and it's like our parliament is a poster of that you know so um, it's, it's very uh, it's very schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, kidnapping of a president who said no, he was just in vacation, and we, you know, and uh, so it is just uh, uh, incredible um, to 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 see more. So, how do you deal with that? Dima? What you say you're working on the article and how to do theater in uh, which is. For me, it's not easy to imagine even. So what, what, what do you think? What do the artists you talk, what do they say? How to do theater? How to react to this pandemic in, in the situation? Is there any, is there any recipe? Well, um, I've, I've heard, you know, I, I, I spoke to um, at least eight artists um, um, over the past few weeks and um, and you know everybody is um, taking t- turns being very pessimistic and and feeling hopeless. 
to some days feeling, uh, you know, oh, okay, let's be productive today. Let's uh, apply for this grant. Let's write another page of our script. Um, and then some days, you know, um, um, uh, a, the a, di a theater director in her, who's in her 50s, who has witnessed the Civil War and who has been, you know, um, in the theater for at least um, 25 years, said that, uh, she said, I, I, maybe I, I'll retire. I, I don't see the space for theater right now. People are starving. People don't have bread on the table and we're thinking about theater. So there are people who, um, who you know, perceive things um, this way and this is their reality. And then there are other artists who say things are paused, right? Things are paused, but theater is very resilient. Art is very resilient. Um, one uh, one artist mentioned you know the that shakespeare um you know small anecdote that he read you know shakespeare when the plague happened the the theaters closed for three years shakespeare sat and wrote his sonnets and then you know theater back theater bounces back theater um transforms and adapts um the i think people are asking um very similar questions is there space for theater in um, in times of pandemic and economic collapse? If there is space for a theater, um, and uh, if we consider it necessary, then what will theater be saying? What will be what will we be talking about? Uh, right? I mean, uh, do we address this massive elephant in the room that right outside the theater door? Um, a few weeks ago, a man committed suicide in front of um, the doors of the theater in, uh, in Hamra Street. He, um, uh, you know, he left a note saying, um, I am not blasphemous, but hunger is blasphemous. And um, so how, what, what, right, the theater usually responds to life, um, it, whether by being in a conversation with it, whether by opening an entire new conversation and uh, imagining uh, alternate uh, universes, right? I mean, theater is infinite, but what do we do now? Um, do we stop? Um, do we continue? If we continue, what, what do we talk about? Um, I spoke with a lot of artists, you know, something as basic as how much will ticket prices be? You know, but how much do you charge for people to who maybe can't afford, um, um, you know, the same, you know, the prices of meat has, has have skyrocketed. So for for people who are buying meat, um, you know, to cook, you tell them no, but please pay um, this amount to attend a play, right? Or are we for audiences a priority um will we stage uh, funny uh, comedy because people need to laugh or does, will that be too frivolous right all of these are being uh, discussed all of these questions all of these questions are uh, being brought to the surface to the surface i mean i think also when when you are in a of course, there's the pandemic, right? Everywhere in the world. So everyone is asking how to do theater and art in the pandemic. But uh, it's more about like uh, uh, sustainability and the form and the aesthetic and the when and the how. And and yeah, but the layer here is that there people are also hungry and we don't have an infrastructure. So there is no... Um, there is not that there is not this safety where okay so the the basics are there basic needs basic rights are there so we can take a pause and look and contemplate and think and so it's very tied to um, to the economy i think more than the pandemic it's my opinion i mean i don't when it comes to lebanon specifically because then i think art is essential i don't think it's uh, I think it's it's absolutely necessary, but the problem is when when people are um, are being put in a position where they have to prioritize uh, eating uh, or maybe even eating out once because they want to eat out in a restaurant where there are other people and uh, 
or going to a theater, then maybe they're going to go to the restaurant, you know, because it's less consuming also and it's easier and it's uh, uh, less mind consuming and emotionally. <laughs> and so this is the problem here that um, you, I think we're in a position where we have to pick our priorities uh, and we don't have the, the release of saying, okay, it's okay, I work from home, I get paid, everything's fine uh, for a few months and uh, I take this moment to reimagine things. And uh, yeah, but that's, that's the practical harsh re side of reality. But I do agree that theater is infinite and resilient and um, we have been through, I don't know if we have been through worse, but we definitely have been through a lot. <laughs> So there was theater, there was art. It never really stopped, even during the war. Yeah. People yeah. changed the shape, you know, changed the way, but they found a way. So. Um, yes, definitely. Um, and this is something a lot of us think, and Yara, as well, um, for this article I'm writing. And, and so many of us said that we never had much, right? We never worked with a lot. It's, we never worked with massive budgets. We never worked with um, uh, with a lot of resources. Every theater uh, for so long has been very DIY. You know, I have a few hundred dollars. What can I do? Um, we, you know, uh, if we can't afford to rent a space, then you know, some people performed in in other people's apartments. We uh, well, suddenly we're all minimalist uh, theater makers with like a very um, very minimalist scenography and and set. And so we've we've always been um, I mean pretty badass at at making theater from very little. And so a lot of theater makers um, and artists that I've interviewed and spoken with, uh, I think so too, is that um, we have been doing this for so long. Um, a lot of people are saying, we're not afraid. Theater is gonna come back. It's just, we have to reimagine the shape it's coming back in. Tell us a bit, are there ideas for reimagining? Uh, yes, um, um, the various ones. Um, I, I, I asked, um, I asked the artists uh, the question, you know, even if it's, it might not be applic applicable, how do you imagine, how do you imagine it? And, um, and, uh, Sahar actually, Sahar Asaf said that in Madrid, she, um, um, she wants uh, experienced um, uh, teatro micro so uh, you know like very short plays happening at the same time in different rooms and you kind of uh, it was I think five euros to attend the play and that can be that or you can pay another five and attend another short play and you know it was two to three actors with very um, uh, basic set so um, the, I can see that happening um, I Somebody else said that we're going to have to um, find other spaces, right? We do not, we don't have five hundred dollars to uh, to rent a theater for for a night. And so, does this mean that we will, um, um, you know, host each other in our apartments? Will we, um, uh, you know, be taking over, you know, little art uh, gallery spaces? Um, or public space, Yara. Uh, you know, when you shared your your kind of imagine, you know, imagine scenario, I thought, you know, it's it's beautiful. If you want to talk about it a little bit, um, yeah. Actually, at the moment, I even though I'm working on something that is very intimate with the audience in a closed space, but I feel that the need right now is to be in an open space for the people and uh, to uh, to maybe work by the seaside. Uh, I mean, we have a beautiful sea in Beirut that is super polluted, so we can't swim in it. So at least maybe we can uh, be there um, together in an open space. 
and I felt it's 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 beautiful to to go back and to uh, sort of promenade promenade in the city just to f to be out with people around around others and feel safe because I guess in a public space we might feel safer right now than being um, and less cold. It's less cold than sitting. Uh, uh, one chair yes, one chair no, one chair yes, one chair no. It's it's weird to, to have these chair structures. It's sad. And I feel being out maybe is um, beautiful and a bit more hopeful. And, um, makes us feel a bit more connected to the city again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, 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 we do not have public spaces. We have parks. Uh, and a big part of the the revolution was to take back public spaces and uh, and I think one way of doing that like Yara said is, um, is through arts, right we will assert our presence uh, in public spaces by performing there by in by performing there by the theater, theater you know, since it exists you know, you know, experience to experience something and so and and uh, you know right now social distancing is much easier if you're in a ma like a, in a huge space and you don't have to worry about the chair that's next to you you know in, in, a, in a small uh, smaller theater so and um, and then other other artists talked about um, radio plays uh, the Zulkak Theater Company, which um, has also been hosted, their their play uh, Heavens was um, streamed on HowlRound actually not too long ago. Um, uh, they said maybe the one of the platforms is this radio plays. You know, mm -hmm. we, another way of stimulating the imagination. We'll you know sit in our own living rooms, maybe in fr invite uh, a friend or two. That's what I did. I invited a kind. Last of wine and we listen. And so, so maybe that's also another. Yeah, so people can host in their home by, by screening of something. Of something. Actually, it's interesting because um, uh, as I was talking and listening, I thought that we really maybe need to go back to basic, basics. Yes, community. Uh, it's like a collective experience and a somewhere outside in a, in a collective space, but also radio plays is something that was very uh, common in, um, in the 80s, in the late 80s, uh, during the war as well. There, there, was this, um, there was this format and yeah, maybe it's a good time to bring it back, whether or not the th things go worse <laughs> politically. It's a beautiful format, I think, in, in all cases. How, if I may ask, I may ask, how did you both get into theater? What was the moment in your life, and, and why do you do it? What, what, what happened that you? Uh, uh, Frank, do you mind repeating uh, what you said? It kind of echoed, yeah, and I didn't. Yeah, we hear an echo from you. Maybe you have a live stream on. That sometimes happens, but most probably it's the connection. What? How did, how did you get into theater? How did that happen? And what does it mean to you? What does theater mean to you? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know when it happened specifically. That's, that's what I knew all my life. That's what I wanted to do. Uh, of course, uh, the what changed with the years, like how I imagined theater would be or the work would be. Uh, but I knew from a very young age that this is what I want to do. And uh, I grew up also in a family of artists and I'm at a place in my life where I say I cannot um, decontextualize that. Of course, it affected how I view things. Of course, it uh, introduced me to that world very, very early on. I mean, and in relation to the radio plays, like my, my parents both did that during the 80s uh, when my father came back to Lebanon from France, actually. And uh, my mother used to translate texts and they would do them on the radio and uh, he was touring in the war, basically. So I've been in theaters since, uh, since I can remember. And um, 
but for me on in my own journey has been very different and i i cherish those differences and i love also that i i have those references with my family um i what it means to me i mean i don't know i think it's it's uh, whether i'm on stage or i'm i'm writing or i'm directing or i'm in a thinking process uh, for a new play or i'm collaborating and I love to collaborate. I love to work with people. For me, it's um, it's an experience. It's a it's a chance to to discover others and discover yourself and say what you feel is necessary to say politically. And um, yeah, that's. <laughs> I didn't expect that question. <laughs> Hmm? It's never an easy never one to ask. No, because um, there's a lot to say. You know, like then I can talk for like an hour now. Um, uh, for me, I uh, I'm I'm the youngest of four children. Four children. And always, uh, 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 that I was, um, you know, my parents were like, okay. We're, we're, done. we're done, and so uh, my, my kind of, kind of uh, and so I, I would stage these little performances at home as a way of just getting attention. And so I feel like that is part of it. Uh, but I feel I feel the the dangers of you know one narrative is that it's never. Part of it. But um, a very important uh, reason why I'm a writer and. And a performer is because it's because around stories. My father, uh, um, you know, at every um, at every lunch, you know, we'd finish lunch and still stay at the table for hours after that, having coffee and dessert. And he would just tell us stories, stories about the Civil War, uh, stories about his childhood. My dad is now ninety years old, and so he has a lot of stories. And, uh, and so I grew up with that. I grew up knowing the importance of stories and storytelling, the magic that uh, a story contains and how it brings people together. And this is one of the reasons I founded Cliffhangers in 2014, um, because stories do things that very little else can do. And so, and I and I think theater, the, the the kind of the core of theater, storytelling, and um, and so I, for me they're inseparable. And so, um, as a writer and a storyteller, one way one way bringing stories to life. So for me, it was the a, a combination a, a that combination made, me, and I can't see it any other. See it any other. Yeah, and so um, one of you is leaving the group, and one of you is staying. That what the question artists are artists are facing. I mean, I I I'm not leaving per se. <laughs> for me, I uh, I think that now there's a a new chapter for a while, and I'm there. You know, I I don't think about leaving and staying uh, as a. I always think about the decisions like that as a temporary thing for me at least i i think about the moment and now what's happening okay i follow that uh, that flow uh, but uh, for sure i'll be coming and going back because i have a lot of projects here as well if they find the time <laughs> but uh, yeah it's definitely a weird time to be leaving temporarily um, things i feel like i'm leaving to australia and i'm going to zurich you know in paris and i feel like i'm going somewhere super far because of the situation the economic situation also not just the traveling due to the pandemic but buying tickets <laughs> buying a ticket to go to zurich or you know um, um i heard your answer I heard but your i heard your answer but i that 
Could repeat it. Could repeat it. Question. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the question is, are, are you continuing your work? Are you continuing your work? Theater artists will uh, the, the big city go outside all our places. Yesterday we had uh, uh, Kelly, Kelly from Indonesia and she said she's part of a movement. We said she's part of a move out of the bigger center of the center of the center of production of um, I'm just going to I'm going to put my headphones on. I think maybe that way I can hear you better. Uh, so just um, Give me a second. But it's also I, cutting. It's cutting a lot. Ah, oh, Yara, um, your experience. That's yeah. true. I might have I might have answered another question completely, actually, because now I'm hearing that. <laughs> also, internet is slowing down in Beirut. Yeah. You know, it's fine in the beginning, and uh, it goes through. Uh, yeah. You know, stages, and people might start since they have electricity watching films and. Uh, yep. Netflix is that popular? Yeah. 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 So it is. You know, this is why it is so complicated. Most people do not do it, and that's why we hear so little because it is complicated. You know, how do you really hear what you have to say if there's only two hours of electricity? There are very few journalists, stage, international journalists, left uh, in Beirut. So what we hear from you is of importance and significance, and so. Um, yeah, Dima. So the question is, how is it for you? Are you going to stay there? Are you, uh, are you say also I'm going to make a pause for one year and uh, focus on something else? And right, um, are you going to stay? Are you continue to work? What is your plan? That is, uh, that is the question, right? I mean, I I am staying. Um, if you had asked me this question before uh, February, I would have had a different answer. You know, I. Um, I, I, uh, I'm a teacher um, and I um, host monthly storytelling nights. I, um, I'm also um, a, write, a playwright and a performer. And, uh, and, I, and I feel like I was, I was doing so much. I was always, we're all aware that Beirut is not an ideal city to be in. Uh, people have been leaving and immigrating and just giving up on the country for, for decades. All of my friends uh, have already left. Uh, you know, and, and Yara is one of my dearest friends, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's also you know, and and also my my director, and it's it's also another a loss a loss for me, and a, um, w even though it's a temporary one, and I'll be seeing her a lot, and I'm sure we'll collab keep collaborating, um, but there was a lot to stay for, uh, there's a lot to fight for, and uh, and you know, whenever I needed a breather or a break, you know, I. Um, just in the past year, I went to uh, London, New York. I went to Sundance. I gave a talk in another city, etc. So um, it's good to take a break from Beirut. We we all need that. But now that we have, we were stripped of everything, right? Um, I I am yeah. I, I think we're all so sad. We, my friends and I, talk about how we cry at least once a day. Um, but but I'm here uh, for now because my family, my parents are here, and so I, I maybe wish I had a more uh, grand answer that I, I want to fight more. I want to help uh, resurrect. Um, you know something in this country but actually no i'm i'm here because of my parents but i know that i'll keep writing i'm still writing i'm uh, i'm working on my second play actually i'm i'm uh, i'm writing that and um and when the theaters open we'll find a way to make theater but um i don't know if i love this um this country anymore So, and 
the economic situation of theater art is so you say artists basically starving artists uh, who's taking care of them how is it uh, how is it um uh, that's a, a good question the thing is um a lot of a lot of artists um are not only artists they're they're teachers they um they have other jobs um and so uh, several of them have another way to financially sustain uh, themselves. Uh, some people, that's all they do. You know, Yara, Yara being one of them, the professional theater makers, etc. And so uh, there are some emergency funds uh, that some companies and some individuals applied for, but there is absolutely no state support at all. Um, and so anything that um, is helping these artists sustain themselves is purely uh, coming out of personal um, initiative and personal effort and personal, uh, um, yeah, just that basically. Um, actually, uh, f funnily enough, I was interviewing one of the one of the members and founders of Zukak the uh, theater company and he said, you know, that the government for a while suggested that they would give um, a, a small amount of money to uh, to small businesses to kind of support them and 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 help them not uh, close or go bankrupt. And he said, what if we tell them that theater, you know, is is a small business? Um, I wonder if they'll if they'll give us some money. It's actually, <laughs> like, a thing, you know. It's actually it is, a job. Of course. <laughs> It is, it is. And, and, and a lot of theater makers and artists, uh, when I interviewed them, they expressed their fear of uh, people not wanting to pay uh, artists, right? Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the theater to, to go back to how it was decades ago when people didn't make money of it. You know, they, they did it because they loved it, but it was amateur theater because um, people would not pay, you know, we couldn't, actors, we couldn't afford to pay actors, couldn't afford to pay directors, etc. And so a lot of uh, artists are afraid for theater to go back to this amateur, um, you know, um, way of theater that um, where they will not make a living out of it, basically. And that's a very significant fear. And it has such a long tradition, theater um, in the Middle East. So many who do say, no, it's not true. You know, the, the work, uh, um, which also we are covering, Marvin Carlson is covering, the Arab, all Arab stages journal, all our publications. It's a very long history and a significant one. And uh, it is heartbreaking to hear what you all say and how endangered it is and what complicated uh, situation. It's almost like a siege, a military siege on a city. And, um, and it's about uh, the survival. What keeps you inspired? What are you guys, are you reading something or listening or are you watching? What, what, uh, what, um, how do you keep your motor warm, as someone said with us here? You know, how does that, that is? Um, we are said that from Indonesia, from the Paper Moon Company, you know, said so it's important. But so, how, what do you, what do you do? What do you read? What do you listen to? What do you watch? Uh, that's a, Excellent. There are some days when I'm when I just binge watch anything that comes up on Netflix. Those are very uh, real days. But as, uh, artwork that sustains me. Um, I recently uh, finished reading uh, uh, Carmen Maria Machado's memoir in the Dream, in the Dream House, um, and it's about a queer uh, a abusive relationship. And so um, it's very much related to the play I'm writing now. And so I'm reading, um, I'm reading a lot about that. I'm also, uh, one of the things that sustain me is actually seeing my parents um, six feet away with a mask on, but uh, going to visit them and uh, ask them to tell me more stories. Uh, my, uh, my father actually suffers from cognitive uh, impairment, and so he forgets a lot of the stories. And, um, and so I'm writing a lot of essays about memory and, um, and inherited memories and what it means to, to have a father who is 90 years old, who, ha who is a wealth of stories, but is slowly losing them. And so 
Um, so a lot of what sustains me is actually going to see my parents and tell them, tell me stories. Always tell me stories. Um, as long as there are stories, uh, we're we're around. We're talking to each other. We are a community, and for me, that that sustains me. And Arabic indie rap. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> what yes. are the musicians? What are those? What are the bands? Uh, well, <laughs> my my very favorite favorite uh, an artist I've been listening to nonstop is Synaptic, um, a Palestinian Jordanian uh, rapper. And uh, what I love about Arabic indie rap is that um, it's angry, it's engaged, it's um, it's coming out of a need to speak. And which is, you know, what uh, us as writers and theater makers also feel. And uh, and so, you know, I'm doing my dishes and I'm like, yeah, you know, like getting all excited while <laughs> I'm just doing the dishes. And, you know, this this is also what sustains us. Other people who share our frustration, our anger at uh, our views at what is going on um, in the world and in this region. Mm. Definitely. I think music is... Uh... I, I wouldn't imagine a life without music and angry music also. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's necessary. I mean, uh, I've been listening to a lot of uh, Afro funk music and also rap. I, I am not a synaptic, but Tafar also is a really cool rapper. Uh, and uh, Brel, I always love to listen to Jacques Brel. He makes me sad and happy and everything at the same time. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, movement sustains me. I, I need to move. I need to train. I work out a lot uh, as a form of meditation. <laughs> it's, it's what keeps me a bit uh, balanced. Um, uh, it makes my head very calm. Um, I've been working also on my text, on my new performance, because I, I've had such uh, an urgent need to do it now. And... Uh, um, I had to deal with the fact that, okay, I need to push it uh, for a certain amount of time. So I've been revisiting the text and working uh, on it. Um, speaking of families, I'm also working on uh, video archives from the 80s and the 90s of um, me and my family in the house where we were just constantly filmed doing nothing. So I'm working on the archives. So it's a lot of family <laughs> as well, um, which is nice, but complicated. Um, and yeah, I've been reading um, a, a novel by Alice Zeniter, who's an Algerian-French uh, writer uh, called uh, L'Art de Perdre, and uh, Roland Barthes as well, uh, Fragment d'un discours amoureux, and I've been reading Octavia Butler, actually, as research for a performance I'm working on with Neumarkt. So it's like a book for a different part of the day. Um, yeah, I also like series, but I haven't had patience recently for series somehow. I'm too too jumpy to focus on series somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's uh, one of the things that, you know, if you want to look at uh, some form of silver lining um, for what we are going through is that suddenly um, works of art, plays, uh, artists that we would not have had access to are now accessible to us, right? Everything is being streamed. Um, uh, theaters in, in various cities are, are streaming their performances um, and, um, and, and dig digging things up from the archives and making it available for free online. And so, yes, everything sucks, but we've had more access to art than, than before. In, um, in this country, and I'm sure, and I'm sure people um, in different parts of the world are feeling the same. So, yeah, it's beautiful. A change, we're coming too close before maybe we ask uh, what you tell our audience, what to think about. What theater inspires you? What theater makers do you look um, up to? Because you, as you say, you, in Europe or the US, people go to theaters and festivals and have access to it, perhaps not as much travels to Lebanon, but what theater, I mean, what theater makers really inspire you? Who do you follow? Um, 
Yara, would you? I always uh, feel uh, I have a blank mind when uh, when I'm asked that question. It's like asking me what is your favorite book or your movie. Or um, I uh, I follow uh, I follow. I don't know. I can't think of a name right now. Uh, it feels like another life somehow. But uh, I, I can say that I love theater that uh, challenges me and that gives me new, uh, new realms to discover. I don't like to, um, to, to see the same things uh, being, um, being produced out of, uh, out of uh, it doesn't inspire me when I feel it's the same topics and the same, even though sometimes the topics are pressing and then they're, they're like echoing everywhere. But I also feel super happy and inspired and curious like a child when, uh, when I'm surprised by new topics and risks. And uh, uh, yeah, I can say this as a state of uh, being, it inspires me. But honestly, I don't know, sorry, I just had a blank of, I couldn't now have a reference somehow. Maybe it will come. Um, for me, I and I mean, I feel the same uh, way Yara does, that it's so hard to pinpoint. But right now, I'm thinking a lot about uh, Amal Rafael Khoury. They're, uh, they're a trans-Jordanian-German uh, playwright um, based in Berlin. And, uh, and they wrote uh, the first play in Beirut or in Lebanon about uh, uh, queer uh, and trans with queer and trans queer stories and, trans and characters stories. and so I um, uh, I consider her or and them they they use various pronouns um, kind of the, the the fairy god human of of the kind of theater that I also make and so um, I consider them a very important figure um, to be inspired from. And uh, I also am thinking about Theater Me Too, uh, based in New York. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sure you're familiar with them. Uh, I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, working with them, of getting to know them, spending time with them, both in Beirut, NYU Abu Dhabi, and uh, in their space in New York. And I was actually supposed to uh, be there working with uh, Ruben and uh, and the company in April uh, for kind of a re-imagining uh, of my play. Um, and so, of course, that is uh, postponed to who knows when. But I, I you know, s similarly to what Yara said, I love theater that takes risk, that experiments, that, uh, you know, uh, people sitting together and thinking, if we had no limits, what can we create? what do we want to say and how can we use everything that is around us to say it and so i'm a huge fan of their work i'm, I'm a huge fan of them individually and as a as a group and uh, so yeah i um uh, i miss experiencing their work and experiencing working with them yeah you mentioned that i mean about you so um, we're getting closer uh, to, to the end, we're a little bit over time, a little bit more, but this is really important to hear from you. So what do you say, um, you who have this economic catastrophe, uh, limited uh, electricity, uh, not the access to food as you would need, theaters closed, no support, what do you think? What do you say to young artists, maybe also the one who are a bit like me, we are more privileged, uh, our listeners, what, what should we use this time for? What should we the time of Corona. What is uh, what? What is the meaning? Or what meaning can we create from it? What should we do in this time? What is of importance? Um, I I don't know where to to begin to answer that. But you know something uh, very you know that that I can think of right now is that. Um, you know, what I said earlier about theater being infinite, art being infinite, art is uh, art is healing, but art is also revolutionary. Revolutions have been uh, started because of books. And, uh, and so we must be doing something right. Um, we're, we're important. And, and, and in times when we feel so small, 
when we feel so helpless um i think it's it's um it's revolutionary but it's also a way of survival to know that we are important and the work we do is important even if we're not making it right now in this moment because of all the obstacles mm -hmm. we will go back to making it and um and and art is always relevant and not only relevant but essential to uh to the way we experience life and um and i would never want to live in a world without it and so is just a reminder that what we do is essential. Uh, if I, it, the internet was cutting a lot, but if I understood uh, right, it's also, uh, I mean, what, what to say to other people maybe who are a bit more privileged in, in that sense, or, and uh, this word echoed a lot for me. And uh, I feel it's very important, uh, if anything, positive comes out of this uh, pandemic that is happening everywhere is to be aware always of the privilege and the different different uh, different privileges because uh, there's a lot and uh, and uh, to, to be aware and um, and understand yeah I, I feel this this has been uh, very present right now on social media every people questioning their privilege and uh, and I think we need more of that and not just speaking about solidarity as a utopic, uh, sexy topic, you know, but actually about actual solidarity and uh, educating ourselves always towards the other and um, tr truly <laughs> and trying to understand the art of other people and their background and uh, maybe re-questioning again our references, you know, and... Uh, yeah, who, who do we always take as reference and why? And I feel it's a good time to question everything. I, I feel that. And that doesn't mean we need to stop or pause or not do art because uh, art for me is a process of constant questioning. That's what we always should do. You know, of course, yeah, we should be sure and we should have confidence, of, but we should always have a bit of doubt. I find that for me beautiful. Um, to, uh, to actually be in a state of questioning. That is the ultimate collective play of the world now because everyone is in the process of asking questions. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a significant. And uh, also the privilege of being privileged, right? The privilege of having, yeah. being able to question your privilege is already such a privilege. Of course. You know, of course, education is a privilege. Being doing what I love is a privilege. You know, there are different uh, different aspects of it. Yeah, or we had this, uh, Jean Luc Nancy, that French philosopher, who said when he was here was about life and art and life. He said, "What is? Of course, we now all think about the value of life, but now we have to think what is the value of the value of life." Right? Mm. We all know. But now we. Have faced such questions even more. And that's thing artists always have done, and that's why it is important to really hear from you and to get that message of from you know, there's a there's a you know, the temperature of this moment, and who knows how it will be in a couple of months or half a year. And so it is uh, significant uh, what you had to say. And thank you for the update. We are you are part of the world uh, theater community of a global community. What you do is important. Uh, the storytelling, uh, your plays. Uh, um, about your experiencing of growing up and your identities and uh, and uh, collaborations with European theatre, so that there is something that uh, or connects us. And uh, it's, it is really heartbreaking uh, to hear how to it is this. And uh, Tina says, I'm not sure if I love my country. And uh, everything becomes so, uh, so, so existentially difficult next to the COVID. And it's perhaps the economic situation is even more complicated. And it's just one of many, many things. It's uh, it truly um, my heart to you and everybody, all, all of your colleagues. Um, I want to thank uh, Adam Ashraf El Saji, who is uh, a student also at the PhD program with us, who helped us to, to make this happen. Uh, so thank you, Adam. And I think it was really important um, that we heard from you. Please do stay in contact. Let us know uh, what perhaps the New York theater community can do. You know, to support. Um, what What do you think? What What should What would be of real help? Um, 
I think it's um, for me it's too soon to tell. I think um, especially that uh, I mean New York is struggling, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, and we should never compare struggles, right? Uh, Roxanne Gay, right, said it's not the oppression Olympics, but right now the struggles happening in the United States are very real. And uh, and I think you know when when I listen to other talks, when I when I experience art that is done by people from other countries, this sustains me, and and I can only hope that our work does the same for others. It really, really does. It gives us, uh, you know, comfort and also that we are not alone in this and that we care, deeply, deeply care. Um, I really, really thank you for joining us. Tomorrow we have Richard Schachner back uh, with us. Uh, who, uh, what I've heard in here, I'm a director, uh, as an educator, editor, and researcher, you will um, join us again. He's preparing a special issue for TDR, his great theater magazine. Uh, journal um, and um, and also to you know try to make sense out of it also some additional meaning we're going to take a break in august and we'll see where how it develops where we go from here so really thank you for for joining us and all my best and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, please stay safe uh, also our audience stay safe wear a mask uh, Stay tuned. Thanks to you really for listening. So many have listened in also to colleagues and artists from around the world. It's very meaningful for them to know that people do listen and care and also know that you guys listen to others. So this is a, a quite a significant, you know, that uh, the little sense of our community, especially also in the U.S. that tends to be isolated. After all, it's also an island, just a very, very what's an island. And, um, well, thank you so much for hosting us. It's um... It's been very important and, and significant to have this conversation. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yes, and definitely. Thank, thank you. Hi to Sahar, if you see her and everybody at the uh, at her theater company. So uh, hope you will be able to join in tomorrow. Thanks again to HowlRound for Thea and BJ for hosting up and the CEO team, uh, Andy and Young. And uh, you guys are now, it's uh, dinner time. You all said you learned to cook again or even more so. No. <laughs> You will have a good, yes. uh, good Lebanese uh, food. So all my best, and who knows one day you might all be swimming the ocean in Beirut. Um, so I hope. Yes. Bye bye. Absolutely. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.